Nikki Strong. Go for it. And this is VOA When the Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Andrew Smith and Faith Perlow tell us how the search for minerals has increased interest in deep sea mining and the possible damage that might cause. Later, John Russell is here to present this week's Everyday Grammar lesson. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here are Andrew and Faith. The mining industry is pushing to explore more of the world's deep oceans to find metals and minerals used for electric vehicles and other technologies. But some scientists are worried that deep-sea mining will damage the environment and the biological systems important to the atmosphere. Scientists, lawyers, and government officials are meeting until November 11th in Jamaica to discuss the issue. The International Seabed Authority, ISA, an independent group created by a United Nations treaty, organized the meeting. The ISA has given 31 exploration licenses for deep ocean waters outside of any country's territory. While it has not given any licenses to begin mining, some experts worry it will do so soon, before rules are in place. Experts say the mining would create dirty water, noise, and light that could harm the ecosystem in the deep sea. They also note that scientists do not know a lot about the deep sea and need to learn more before making decisions about mining. Less than 1% of the world's deep ocean waters have been explored. Most of the current exploration activity is in a large region between Hawaii and Mexico. Mining companies argue that deep sea mining is less costly and causes less damage than mining on land. The International Energy Agency estimated that demand for minerals will increase six times by 2050. A report from Fitch Ratings that was released in October said demand will increase because electric vehicles and renewable energy technologies need minerals found in the sea. Nauru, a small island northeast of Australia, is leading the push for mining. It hopes to financially gain from the mining for minerals that are used in technologies such as electric car batteries. But officials in other countries are worried about the effects of mining and are pushing for new rules. We are still very concerned about the consequences, said Elsa Moreira Marcelino de Castro, Brazil's representative at the meeting. French President Emmanuel Macron said earlier this year that he supports a ban 
on deep sea mining. Germany, which has two exploration contracts, announced on Wednesday that it would not sponsor such mining at this time. New Zealand, Fiji, and Samoa want a ban on the mining until more is known about its possible effects. A move supported by some scientists and legal experts. The ocean holds more carbon than the Earth's atmosphere, plants, and soil, and scientists are finding new kinds of plant and animal life during exploration trips. Diva Ammon is a marine biologist. She said studies take months or even years to complete. We do not understand what lives there, how they live there, the global function that this ecosystem plays, she said. She added that because minerals grow only 1 to 10 millimeters every million years, the deep sea is slow to recover from damage. Other concerns over deep sea mining include how money would be divided and how mining companies would be supervised. Countries who have signed the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea can sponsor private companies seeking exploration licenses. The United States is one of several countries that is not party to the convention. Pradeep Singh is a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany. He said there are worries that private mining companies might look for a sponsor country based on reduced tax deals, weak environmental laws, and other influences. Michael Lodge is the Secretary General of the ISA. He said at the meeting in Jamaica that the agency wants to ensure protection of the marine environment while member countries work on proposed rules. I'm Faith Perlow. And I'm Andrew Smith. Imagine a time when you heard information about the personal life or behavior of another person, a friend, a neighbor, a classmate, or even a famous person. In other words, you heard gossip. What kinds of terms and structures do English speakers commonly use to gossip? Let's start with a few important terms and definitions. Gossip is information about the personal lives and behavior of other people. The information can be either correct or incorrect. While many people have a bad opinion of gossip, at least when they are the subject of it, the reality is that most people join in it from time to time. English speakers commonly use a few verbs when gossiping. These verbs often connect with the senses, such as hearing and seeing. For example, I heard that Tom got into trouble. Sally said she saw the police arrest him. In the example, we have the past forms heard and saw. Note that the speaker is telling information about Tom's life and possible behavior. The speaker did not actually experience the events. In our example, the speaker reported something. This is a general way that gossip spreads. One person says or tells something to another person. As a result, verbs that describe speaking, such as tell or say, 
are commonly used in gossip. Consider these examples. Sally told me about Tom's troubles. Sally said Tom has been getting into trouble. Gossip often makes up part of a larger discussion. As a result, speakers often bring up the subject of gossip by asking a question. The helping verbs do and have play an especially important part in these questions. This is because these helping verbs are used to create yes or no questions. Let's explore one common structure. Do or have plus subject plus main verb plus the rest of the sentence. For example, Did you hear about Tom? Have you heard about what Tom did? Note that the main verb in both of these examples is hear or heard. Although the verb's exact meaning connects with the ear or the sense of hearing, it often also has a broader meaning. In other words, it can also mean to be aware of something. For example, a person might say they heard about a scandal even if they learned of the scandal by reading about it in a newspaper or on the internet. Let's take some time to work with these ideas. Use the verb hear to talk about a famous actor's divorce. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here is one possible answer. I heard about the actor's divorce. Now form a question about a person named Sally. Be sure to use helping verbs such as do or have. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here are two possible answers. Did you hear about Sally? Have you heard about Sally? The goal of today's report was not to make you want to gossip. Rather, the goal was to get you thinking about how grammar connects with a common subject of discussion. The next time you listen to English speakers, perhaps in a movie or a show, pay careful attention to how they share information. And if you notice questions such as, Did you hear about? Or, Have you heard about? Then you might want to prepare yourself to listen to some gossip. I'm John Russell. <laughs> just heard John Russell present this week's Everyday Grammar Lesson. Now, John joins me on the show to talk a little more about the word gossip. Hi, John. Hi, Ashley. Great lesson this week. Thank you. I hope our listeners enjoyed it, too. I noticed in your report you used gossip as a noun and a verb. Gossip as a noun means information about the personal lives or behaviors of other people, and gossip as a verb means to spread such information. But what are some other ways gossip can be used? You can call someone a gossip if they talk about the private details of other people's lives a lot. For example, Ted is such a gossip. He's always talking about his classmates' personal business. You can also use the word gossiper instead. You might say, Ted is such a gossiper. Finally, the adjective form is gossipy. You can use gossipy to describe a person who likes to gossip or a publication, like a magazine or website, that writes a lot about the lives of famous people. Thanks for taking the time to explain gossip to us, John. And thanks for joining me on the show today. You're welcome. See you next time. From VOA Learning English, welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time on our program, we talked about the election of 1840. William Henry Harrison 
easily defeated Martin Van Buren and became the ninth president of the United States. By that time, another political force was growing in the country. It did not come from Van Buren's Democratic Party, nor did it come from Harrison's Whig Party. It grew out of slavery. The dispute over slavery appeared to have been resolved for a time. A political compromise in 1820 kept a balance between slave and non-slave states. The compromise also barred slavery in the northern part of the Louisiana Purchase. But during the 1830s, the issue of slavery rose to the surface again. A major reason why the dispute came to life again was cotton. Cotton plants grew in many fields across the southern states. Black slaves planted, picked, and took care of the cotton crops. They also had other duties on southern farms. Northern ships then carried southern cotton to the markets of Europe. Manufactured goods needed in the south came from the north. The situation deeply troubled the political leaders of the South. They worried that cotton made their states economically dependent on the industrial North. What made things worse was the fact that most federal spending on public works projects went to the Northern states. Then there was the old dispute over import taxes. Taxes on foreign goods mostly helped the manufacturers of the North. The taxes were to be lowered in 1842, but that was still years away. No one could be sure what would happen then. Such were the general political and economic conditions in the United States when the abolitionist movement began to make itself known. Abolitionism was an effort to end slavery and the slave trade. At first, religious groups organized the abolitionist movement. Then, in the 1830s, anti-slavery societies began operating in New York and New England. Many abolitionist groups published newspapers, pamphlets, and booklets they flooded the country with anti-slavery petitions. Abolitionists believed slavery was evil and that there could be no compromise with evil. They did not like the idea that slaves should become free slowly over time. And they did not think slaveholders should be paid to free their slaves. They just wanted all slavery to disappear immediately. They were regarded as this wild-eyed, fanatic group on the far left inside of the anti-slavery movement. People who were willing to do anything, radicals, they would upend society. This was the view that the people had of them. Howard Jones is an historian. For many years, he taught at the University of Alabama. He says the abolitionists did not have much popular support. In the South, slavery was not a question of right or wrong. It was a question of survival. Some Southerners believed that without slavery, their whole economic system would lie in ruins. In the North, the abolitionists did not yet have major support. Some feared the abolitionist movement would weaken the rule of law. Even if they did not like slavery, these people believed the Constitution permitted it. As a result of the public feeling at the time, abolitionists struggled to communicate their message. Some states even sought to stop the flow of anti-slavery literature 
across their borders. In 1836, the House of Representatives declared it would not listen to any anti-slavery petitions. This decision became known as the gag rule. The Senate did not pass such a rule, but it did develop a complex, indirect method to delay action on anti-slavery petitions. Then something strange happened. Historian Howard Jones says some abolitionists believed the event was God's way of helping their cause. In August of 1839, a slave ship appeared in waters off the coast of New York. The ship was carrying two white Spanish-speaking men and about 50 men, women, and children from Africa. The captain was missing. American sailors stopped the ship and brought everyone to the mainland. No one knew what to do with the Africans. Were they criminals? Slaves? If so, who did they belong to? The Africans did not speak English or Spanish, so they could not explain themselves. The government jailed the Africans in New Haven, Connecticut, while officials tried to decide what to do. The slave ship was called the Amistad, and the case became known as the Amistad Case. One of the leaders of the abolitionist movement, a man named Louis Tappan, was very wealthy. Howard Jones says that Mr. Tappan sought to use the Amistad case to gain support for ending slavery. What Tappan wanted to do was to use his almost unlimited financial resources to take these people to court, the Amistad captives, 53 of them, and show that they were human beings, that they had a right to be free. The abolitionists found a free black man who spoke both English and Mendi, the language of a few of the Africans. This translator helped explain what happened. The Mendi said they had been kidnapped from their homes in West Africa. They were forced to march to the coast. There, white slave traders bought them. At that time, the United States... Spain, and many other countries had signed treaties to ban the international slave trade. The United States had also made buying slaves from Africa illegal, but the government did not enforce the law. A Portuguese ship brought the Mendi and several hundred other captured Africans to Cuba. Many died of sickness starvation, or beatings on the long trip across the Atlantic Ocean, which was called the Middle Passage. Those who survived were brought to a market in Havana. Cuba was a Spanish colony at the time. Spanish law said slavery was legal on the island, but the slave trade was not. To get around the law, Many traders acted as if captured Africans had been living in Cuba as slaves for a long time. For instance, one of the young Mendi men was named Sengbe Pie. Two Cuban middlemen bought him and about 50 other men, women, and children for farms on the other side of the island. The middlemen wrote his name in their records as Joseph Sinke. They gave the other Africans Spanish names, too, so it would seem like the Africans had been born in Cuba. Then they loaded the group onto a ship called the Amistad, a name that means friendship in Spanish, and chained them below deck. Historian Howard Jones says the Amistad was like a taxi. It would transport slaves wherever you wanted them to be taken. Now, they weren't really slaves. They had never been enslaved, but they were called that at this point. That's a critical 
issue in this whole thing. A few nights later, Sengbe Pie and some of the other Africans broke free. They found weapons and waited until sunrise. The next morning, Pie and his shipmates killed the captain of the Amistad and the cook. Two crew members escaped. The Cuban middlemen were the only white people who remained. The Africans said they would let the Cubans live, but only if they brought the ship back to Africa. The middlemen agreed. During the day, they sailed the Amistad southeast, but at night, they turned the ship northwest toward the United States, hoping to arrive one day in a friendly southern port. Nearly two months later, the food and water on the Amistad were gone. Several of the Africans took a small boat to land to get more supplies. The captain of a government ship saw them. He brought the Africans and the Amistad into port in the northern state of Connecticut. The Cuban middlemen told their side of the story. They said the Africans were slaves who had revolted and claimed the ship's passengers as property. The Spanish government agreed with the middlemen. It demanded that the ship and the Africans be returned to Cuba. Spain's queen said that Spanish law would decide what happened next. Martin Van Buren, who was president at the time, liked the Spanish idea. He did not want to cause problems with southern voters and politicians. He wanted to avoid the issue. But it was too late. The captain of the government ship said the Amistad and the Africans on it belonged to him. He said... He had found them, and he had a right to sell the Africans as slaves. The captain gave the middlemen permission to go, and he gave the Africans to the U.S. government to decide the case. The charges against the Amistad Africans were serious. They were accused of being murderers and pirates. If they were found guilty... They could be enslaved for the rest of their lives or put to death. But the abolitionists claimed the Amistad Africans were something entirely different. They said the Africans were captives who had been kidnapped illegally. The Africans should not be punished, the abolitionists said, but returned to Africa. Historian Howard Jones says... The abolitionists looked forward to presenting the case in court. They also hoped Sengbe Pie and the others could help with their communication problems. They wanted the Amistad Africans to tell Americans what life in Africa was like. But more important than that, what it was like on the dread African slave trade, that middle passage, those thousands of miles of crossing the ocean to the New World. And then, by extension, throw a dark light on what slavery was like itself. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History, from VOA Learning English. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.